On June 4, 1967, the infant state of Israel found itself on the brink of annihilation. Israelis still lived with the agonizing memory of the Holocaust. Now the Arab nations surrounding Israel vowed to make the blue Mediterranean run red with the blood of Jews. We were thinking in terms of the Israelis are going to be thrown to the water. On the morning of June 5, 1967, Eitan ben Eliyahu flew one of the first missions against Egyptian airfields in the Sinai. This is a matter of life and death. This is a matter of Israel is going to be destroyed. Uh, people were in panic. Uh, people were talking about uh, the imminent destruction of the state of Israel, of a war in which there will be an enormous number of casualties, at least 10,000 people will be killed. Rabbis in Jerusalem anticipated so many deaths, they actually designated all of the public parks in Jerusalem as cemeteries. Just before the war, the joke in Israel was, last one's out, turn off the lights. But this black humor didn't mask the fear that many Israelis genuinely anticipated a catastrophe. Israel found itself outnumbered and outgunned on three fronts. Egypt to the south, Jordan to the east, and Syria to the north. The Soviet Union had poured two billion dollars worth of arms into the Arab nations. Israel's enemies brought twice as many soldiers, three times as many tanks, and four times as many airplanes to the battlefield. But just before the war, Egypt, Israel's main enemy, suffered a series of major mistakes and mishaps. There was this uh, uh, miscommunication between the President Nasser uh, and his top generals, and everything didn't work according to what they thought. And when the war broke, uh, you could see and hear, which we did. We heard them. You could see and hear that the Egyptian high command was not in control. Egypt's high command also dismissed warnings by mid-level Egyptian intelligence officers of an imminent Israeli air attack. The night before the war, Egypt's commander-in-chief, Abed Amir, gathered his high command for a party at an airbase far away from the front lines. They were caught uh, by surprise, totally. I mean, some of them were trying to uh, take to the air in order to join their units. They couldn't do it. Two weeks before the war, Egypt replaced nearly all of its commanders in Sinai with officers unfamiliar with the terrain. On the morning of June 5th, Jordanian radar detected the Israeli Air Force taking off. They sent a red alert to Cairo, but the decoding officer used the wrong day's code and failed to decipher the vital information. The warning never came. Instead, the Israeli Air Force decimated the Egyptian Air Force on the ground, the key to the outcome of the war. Some, like author Sarah Rigler, who's written on the Six-Day War, believe this series of Egyptian mistakes reveals the work of an unseen hand. You can say, oh, wow, what a lucky coincidence, where you can see the divine hand. We see that, that God arranged all these things to happen the way they did because he wanted the Israeli strike to succeed, he wanted us to win, he wanted us to regain our holy places. To some, the confusion in the Egyptian command just before the war evoked memories of the biblical story of Gideon routing the enemies of Israel. Instead of annihilation, Israel won one of the most decisive victories in military history. Many Orthodox Jews and Christians believe the Jewish nation had witnessed a miracle. For evangelical Christians, the Six-Day War was a huge moment of seeing God's hand intervene on behalf of the Jewish people. I mean, that was really what I think so extraordinary, is that you had this moment where uh, Arab leaders, Islamic leaders, were saying, we're going to throw Jews into the sea, and it looked like another Holocaust was imminent, and suddenly, in six days, uh, the Jewish people uh, defended themselves, destroyed their enemies, uh, tripled their land, recaptured control of Jerusalem for the first time in 2,000 years, and on the seventh day they rested. That just sounded way too biblical for, uh, for evangelicals all over the planet, and they, uh, they rejoiced with the Jewish people. In the immediate aftermath of the war, everyone, religious and secular alike, recognized that this was from God because it was just so implausible. I mean, here everybody was expecting a tremendous defeat. This is a miracle. Even Moshe Dayan, who was the commander of the Israeli forces, 
and who was a very secular person. He went to visit the Western Wall the day after it was liberated, and there's a tradition to put, you know, like put little notes to God in the wall. So he put a little note to God between the crevices of the wall, and of course, as soon as he left, the newspaper men in their typical <laughs> discreet way <laughs> ran and took the note out and read it. What did it say? And it was a line from Psalms that said, this is from God, it's wondrous in our eyes. Hi, good afternoon. Uh, Mayor Weinstein here. Well, actually, it's uh, getting closer to evening here in Israel. Uh, I'm here now uh, entering the Kotel, the Western Wall. Uh, I walked through the uh, Damascus Gate. Uh, a lot of Israeli police. There's no incidents. Uh, very minor. There's uh, anti-Israel uh, reporters there that uh, I don't know if I had any effect on them, but uh, I said what I had to say the uh, double standard, the anti-Semitism is blatant. Everything is viewed by uh, Hamas supporters, BDS, as uh, Jewish pro provocation that Jews are walking through Sharshvam, uh, which they call the Damascus Gate, uh, walking to the uh, Kotel to uh, pray. It's unbelievable. But uh, here I am. Uh, it's a little early right now, and about. Uh, uh, 8 o'clock Israel time, that's when festivities are going to be taking place here at the, uh, at the Kotel. Let's see if I can spin this around. Uh, no, not yet, but uh, I can certainly turn it and show people. As was apparent, uh, people are just starting to arrive. Uh, there were two routes today. Uh, one route was through the Jaffa Gate. The other route was through the uh, Damascus Gate. And that's the route I took. You know, like I said, there was a little bit of tension there. Uh, nothing we can't handle. Um, I think the Israeli police is uh, way too soft. I think even the government that there is, the coalition government, I don't really like co uh, um, criticizing governments here, uh, Naftali Bennett or Yair Lapid, but uh, Yair Lapid um, claims to be an expert speaking out and taking action against anti-Semitism. When you see mobs uh, on the Temple Mount preaching uh, Jew hatred to kill Jews, Hamas flags, and that's allowed, and when you have an imam on the Temple Mount that it says it's forbidden for Muslims, Arabs, to sell property to Jews and that he's not removed 
by the police. Uh, this type of anti-Semitism should never be permitted on the Temple Mount. Muslims and Arabs, anyone who wants to come to the Temple Mount and pray in peace, no problem, you're welcome. You want to come here and use it as a platform to espouse Jew hatred? No, not at all. And uh, I expected more from Yair Lapid. Uh, he's been going on a campaign, uh, is really targeting a uh, member of Knesset, Itmar ben Gavir, calling him an extremist, calling him everything under the sun. Uh, it's close to incitement. Uh, that's an opinion that some people have. Maybe, maybe not. Uh, maybe it's all fair game in politics. But, um, you know, he's trying to blame the uh, uh, Hamas supporters' uh, um, threats on Itamar ben Uh You know, we should be mindful that uh, during Ramadan, when Ramadan was starting, uh, Yair Lapid, the foreign minister of Israel, he visited the Israeli police, as he should, at the uh, just outside the Damascus Gate, Shar Shem, and Hamas supporters and Jordan, the government in Jordan, condemned Yair Lapid for doing that, and he said that was a uh, provocative move by him. So, you know, I'm not a big fan of uh, double standards; they're immoral. And basically, when Yair Lapid speaks out against anti-Semitism. Take the bow by the horns then and do something about anti-Semitism. It's rampant here. It's all over the place. Every single person who holds a Hamas flag, that's what his message is. No Israel. Jews have no rights. And every Imam that considers themselves a religious leader and an example to families, to Muslim families, that preaches such anti-Semitism no. So Yair Lapid, he's, uh, he's not doing the job. And uh, Naftali Bennett, the Prime Minister of Israel, with such blatant anti-Semitism, kind of silent. Uh, I think the Prime Minister of Israel should uh, lead the Jerusalem march to the Kotel. So where is he? He's not coming. That speaks volumes. That speaks volumes. And I'm not saying that uh, Netanyahu was perfect, but uh, these individuals, they're trying to present themselves to the Jewish people that they're forthright and upfront, and they don't tolerate anti-Semitism, but yes, they do. Yes, they do. I know what anti-Semitism is. I've devoted my life to anti-Semitism. Now, we have an Israeli police. We have Jewish police officers. We have an army here, a Jewish army. We won the 67 war, we won the 48 war, we won every war. There were miraculous wars against all odds. It's time for proper leadership in Israel to take off the gloves and take care of these Jew haters. Take care of Hamas and, all, and their support infrastructure in Israel. That's what they have to do. That's really what the meaning of Jerusalem Day should be. Vanquish the enemy. Pulverize the enemy into full submission. If they don't, they got to go somewhere else. Because since I've been here for two months, there's been a wave of terrorist attacks. And it's being celebrated. Candies are being given out. Can you imagine? Candies are being given out. Anyways, Mayor Weinstein, I'm signing off. Please share this. Uh, I'll have more for you. There's going to be all kinds of entertainment here at the Koto. Like I said, people are coming. It's going to be jam-packed here with thousands of people. So thank you very much and please share. So that's the uh, mayor of Weinstein coming to us live from the hotel. We'll be picking up his uh, conversations and videos and live recordings throughout the day. Um, we're going to now play little song but along the lines of what he was saying let's not forget that it specifically says in the talmud that who comes to kill you get up early to kill him first well when the uh, palestinians and iran and other groups are saying they're going to kill us we're obligated to defend ourselves now we're going to play a little song 
by Yonina, who's a great little duo, husband and wife team out of Israel. And then we're back live with Mayor a little later in the show. אוויר הרים צלול כיין, וריח אורנים. ניסע ברוח ארבעים, עם כל פעמונים. מופטר דמעתי לנו באבן, שבויה בחלומה. העיר אשר בדן יושבת, ובליבה חומה. ירושלים של זהב, ושל נחושת ושלו, הלא לכל שירייך אני. כינו ירושלים של זהב, ושל נחושת ושלו, הלא לכל שירייך אני. המים, כיכר השוק ריקה, ואין פוקד את הר הבית בעיר העתיקה. ובמראות אשר בסלע, מהללות רוחות, ואין יורד אל ים המלח בדרך יריחו. ירושלים של זהב, של נחושת ושלו, הלא לכל שירייך אני. כינו ירושלים של זהב, של נחושת ושלו, הלא לכל שירייך אני. שוק ולכיכר, שופר קורא בהר הבית בעיר העתיקה. ובמראות אשר בסלע, אלפי שמשות זוכות. נשוב נרד אל ים המלח בדרך יריחו, ירושלים של זהב. של נחושת ושלו, הלא לכל שירייך אני. כינו ירושלים של זהב, של נחושת ושלו, הלא לכל שירייך אני. We'll be back shortly with some more live interviews as well as some videos. Some are historical, some are musical. We'll see you all back shortly. <laughs> 